Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Some of you may know what I do on a daily basis is I deal with people and how they influence each other, how people kind of get to understand what people are thinking. And there's a lot of data recently on the brain, which I love the brain. And the brain actually, there's data now that shows the difference between a brain of a narcissist and of an egomaniac compared to a regular American. Like if you were to take the brain out of Donald Trump and put that on a scale and then take the brain of Hillary Clinton, take it out and put it on a scale, both of them would die. <laughs> and America wins. <laughs> Absolutely. So. Why did I tell you that quick joke? Because I want you to realize that we are libertarians. And because of that, we want something different. We want to stop the old ways. We want to stop the idea that we can just find a problem and sick the government on it. And now it becomes a war on this, a war on that, a war on this. We haven't won any of those wars, and that's a problem. Now, I know what you're saying. You're saying, Larry, I know how bad drugs can be. I see the damage that they can do. I see how they can destroy families how they can destroy people. And that's true. So it seems crazy. Why in the world? Why in the world would I want to legalize them? If they're that damaging, why would I do that? We have to ask yourself this question. For the addict, for the addict, for the user, is the right answer prison? For someone who is an addict, who's already probably lost their family, probably lost their looks, probably lost their health, probably lost their career, is now the next step prison? Is that the answer? Let's put them in jail. That'll teach them. Loss of, of health, family, looks, career, that's not enough? I gotta put you in jail? How cruel are we? How cruel are we? But I'll go one step further. There are problems that, that the war on drugs creates. The war on drugs creates more problems. It creates more death. Things you may not realize. How about illegal guns? We talk about illegal handguns all the time, illegal guns. How are we going to get these illegal guns out of people's hands? Well, let me ask you something. Do anybody, anybody here own a gun? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. We all own guns, all of us, every single one of us. But right now, the cops have them. We pay taxes, and the cops hold our guns. That's what they do. Because when we have a problem, what do you do? You call a guy or a gal with a gun, a cop. So you call your guns when you need them. You just call for them. 911, somebody with a gun comes. Awesome. What happens when you're in a black market? What happens if you call the cops, they arrest you and put you in jail because you're a user? What happens if they call and put you in jail because you're a dealer? Can you call the cops anymore? You just lost the guns. What are you going to do? Buy some, illegally. Legal guns come from the black market. If they could use our guns, they wouldn't go buy guns, would they? So the war on drugs, by default, increases illegal guns. Pretty bad, huh? So we don't realize that. It's an extra thing. These people are getting shot? That's terrible. But I'll go one step further. Not only do you, as a drug user or a drug dealer, not have cops, you don't have courts. No court system. How are you going to enforce your contracts? Street justice. You're going to shoot people in the streets. You're going to break legs because you don't have a court system. Luckily, McDonald's doesn't shoot up the people from Burger King, right? They have a problem, they go to court, right? Sony's having a problem with Samsung, they go to court. They couldn't go to court, they'd be blood in the streets. These guys can't, they can't use courts. I'll go one step further. Not only, not only are they not going to be able to use street justice, not only, I'm sorry, not only are they not going to use courts, but they can't use courts for civil issues also. So how about things like quality control? None. What does that mean? People overdose and die. What are you going to do? Sue the dealer who gave you the bad drugs? It's not going to happen. So the dealer decides, I'll give you whatever I want to give you. And you overdose and you die. So now we have more people dying. Street justice, illegal guns, overdose. That's the war on drugs. So it's more than just someone being a user. I'll go one, one step more personally. Many people who may know. People, women who are addicted, what happens when they get pregnant? Are they going to go to a doctor? Prenatal care? No. You have more miscarriages, abortions, you have more uh, problems with pregnancies, complications, all of that too. War on drugs. People can't go get help when they need help. Why? Because they'll get arrested. 
because they'll go to jail. War on drugs. That war makes things worse, not better. You might say, well, wait a minute, these guys are taking drugs. They're going to take drugs anyway. Why don't we at least help them? I'll go further. It destroys our rights as Americans. Because now I have to stop that war on drugs. I got I to do that. So what I'm going to do? Stop and frisk. What am I going to do? Grab people and put them into jail. What am I going to do? I'm going to use civil forfeiture. You, many of you may have heard, heard about that. I can literally come by and just take your stuff. And I get all the time people telling me, Larry, that doesn't happen. Cops can't just go to you and see that you have $4,000 in your pocket and take it. Yeah, they can. They can absolutely just go to you, say, you have $4,000. I think you're a drug dealer. I think that. I'm taking your money and confiscating it. And guess what your rights are? Almost none. If you have enough money to go ahead and sue, you might get some of that back in a couple of months. Maybe that could happen. But let me ask you something. Who carries that much money around? Poor people who don't trust banks. That's who carries that kind of money around. People who don't trust banks, immigrants who don't trust banks. They carry their cash in their hand, in their pocket, in their bag. Yeah. To take your money from an immigrant or someone who, that's their life savings, how are they going to find a lawyer? Where are they going to get their lawyer from? They're not. They're done. Where do they take your car? That's your way to go to work. You're three months from bankruptcy. You're done. All this does is punish the poor. All this does is punish the poor. Because this goes to the next step, and that is race relations. If I am taught as a drug enforcement agent that I will fund my own department or division by what I take, right? That's how I fund it. If I don't take, I don't get funded. So I have to go out and take. Who am I going to take from? That gated community that's full of lawyers? Uh-uh. Those guys, they vote. They, they donate to politicians. They're lawyers. They'll actually sue me. They'll run against me and, and, and get, make sure I get booted out of sheriff. I'm not doing it. No way. I'm going to poor communities where the people either have color or immigrants who don't understand the law, who are scared, and I'm going to confiscate from them. The problem is I've been doing this now as, as an institution for decades. So now even the new cop who comes in, who has no preconception about who's a bad guy and who's not, is taught, no, 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 we hunt here, guy. And every person this guy sees every day who's a bad guy, well, he's brown. So I guess bad guys are brown, aren't they? My father was a cop. I know. He had friends who thought everybody was bad because this guy was undercover, and everybody he met was a bad guy. So he assumed everybody was bad. We'd walk around and he'd say, oh, I wonder when he's going to get, oh, he'll get in trouble soon. Oh, that guy's a bad guy. He was pointing at people randomly and deciding what crimes they had committed. Because he had spent so much time undercover, he thought everybody was bad. Well, imagine you. You spend three, four, five, six, ten years, and the vast majority of people that you arrest are brown. What do you think? It's institutionalized racism that happens because of the war on drugs. The war on drugs is immoral. The war on drugs is ineffective. The war on the drugs is a horrible blight on our nation. And let me give you the example list of all the times prohibition has worked. Done. <laughs> Done. That's how often prohibition works. Never. Yet we keep thinking the answer is try to stop them. All we're doing is making things worse. All we're doing is hurting our nation. If you look at any example of when you've released prohibition and try to help people, things get better. Now to be clear, not always right away. And the end of the war on drugs would have some disruption initially. There would be some problems initially. Of course there would be. But over time, we could actually heal. We could heal our racial wounds. We could heal our addiction wounds. We could heal our prison wounds. We could stop putting people in jail and ruining their lives forever. Remember what we're doing here. With mandatory minimums, which is the next terrible thing about the war on drugs, completely, again, unconstitutional, I, I get arrested and the judge is no longer a judge and all of a sudden now I have to do 20 years or 30 years. My life is over. If I have family or friends, done. 
So what our society has said is because I don't like a substance that you have, your life should be over. Now another next step. Larry, how can you make drugs legal? What about the children? Well, guess what? Age limits would still apply, right? You still wouldn't want non-adults, non-adults to have drugs. Of course you wouldn't. Of course not. So child abuse would still be child abuse. If you gave your kid heroin, you would still go to jail or be arrested because that's child abuse, as if you gave your kid anything. If you gave a kid rat poison, rat poison's legal. If you give a kid rat poison, that's child abuse. So the idea of giving children drugs doesn't change. It's still bad whether the substance itself is illegal or not. But I go one step further. If you rob or steal to get that substance, it's still a crime. Robbing and stealing is bad. Theft is bad. It's a crime. If I rob to steal booze, if I rob to, to get heroin, it doesn't matter. It's still a crime. So it doesn't all of a sudden mean everyone starts doing drugs or kids start doing drugs. It just means one important thing. I don't put people in jail for having a substance. I put people in jail if they do something that's wrong or bad that creates a victim. And that's no matter what, drug or not. And I go one step further. We'll actually have less addicts and less death because when the war on drugs goes away, the other bad things the war has created go away, which is meth. Meth is a terrible, horrible drug, as many of you know, it's an epidemic that is directly caused because of the war on drugs. Why? It's made drugs too expensive. You make drugs legal, cocaine becomes an okay drug. MDMA becomes an okay drug people could use recreationally, right? All of a sudden, who's taking meth anymore? No, why would you take meth? I could afford a better drug. I could afford a better drug. I would take that drug instead. Meth goes away. We created meth. All that terribleness that happens because of that, we did that because we said, we'll show you. I'll stop you from doing it. And they made meth. Well done, war on drugs. 40 years of punishment, 40 years of embarrassment, 40 years of a prison industrial complex. It's a terrible, immoral thing that should stop tomorrow. And any executive, governor, president, mayor, who can move against the war on drugs, they should immediately. Thank you. I want to turn to something that's very similar, and that's the war on terror. So another war that we've decided we're going to win, and we've lost that one too. I want, if you could, imagine something. I'll tell you a story. Imagine something. Imagine, can I, can I use you as an example? Sure. All right. Stay this fine. Imagine there's a car right here. It's a car right here. I'll give you a brick. Here's a brick. Do you want to throw a brick into that car? No. no. Thank you. You're a good man. Appreciate that. Good. I picked the right guy. Love that. Okay. Now, hold on. I'll tell you something else, though. It is now, as of now, I have magic powers, legal for you to throw a brick in that car. Will you throw a brick? No. Why not? It's destruction for no reason. Yes, exactly. There is no reason for him to do that. I made it by magic legal. Oh my God, this is great. I love this so far. Hold on, we're going to keep going. But now you see in that car, do you have, is it, can you think of someone who's close to you right now, a family member? Can you think of that person? Mm -hmm. Who is that person? My sister. Your sister. In that car right now is the guy who just killed your sister. It's his car. He just killed your sister. You know it was him because you watched him do it. You literally watched him murder your sister. You have a brick now. There's his car. You throw the brick? Probably. Yeah. It's illegal now. You throw the brick? You throw the brick? Yeah. Yeah. You still throw the brick, even though I made it illegal. It doesn't change. You throw the brick. Let me go one step further. You believe in magic. No. In this case, you do. You believe in magic. And you believe that if you throw a brick through that window and it hits that guy, your sister will magically come back to life. You will be able to see your sister again if, you, if that brick goes through that window. You believe that in your heart. If you throw that brick and it hits that guy, you see your sister again. I decide I'm going to put a cop in front of that car. You throw the brick? Yeah. Yeah. I put 20 cops. You throw the brick? Yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter. 
I threaten that if you throw that brick, I will kill you. You throw the brick? Yeah. yeah! That is terrorism. That is terrorism. They have seen us murder them for decades. They have watched us drone and bomb and shoot the people they love. It doesn't matter how much security we put up. It doesn't matter how much we threaten them. It is irrelevant. They will throw the brick through that car, no matter what, because they are human. They're not bad. They're not evil. They're just people. And we decided, you know what the answer is? Hit him with a stick. <coughs> Punished him. I threatened to kill you. I don't care. Kill me. Throw in a brick. I don't care. This is the war we have right now. And we're trying to win it by putting more guards around the car, by threatening more. All it does is make more terrorists. We're losing this battle tremendously. And here's the worst part. Not only are we losing this battle, not only are we losing it, again, we are creating more pain for ourselves. It's just like the war on drugs. We're losing the war on drugs and hurting ourselves. And now we're losing the war on terror and we're holding ourselves, hurting ourselves. We're hurting ourselves because what are we doing? Now, privacy out the window. Doesn't matter. Privacy out the window. Who cares about that? Your privacy, who cares? I have to stop a terrorist. Who cares? Surveillance? Surveillance, who cares? Big Brother, okay. Your rights, Fourth, Sixth, First Amendment, psh, gotta keep you safe. That became the next thing. I gotta keep you safe. Well, I was a Marine. I took an oath to the same oath the President takes. And my oath was not to protect you. That was not what my oath was. My oath was to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. It's the same oath the president takes, and it's the one thing he's not doing. And the president has done that in years. They are destroying the Constitution to protect the people. That's not what we're supposed to do. We protect the Constitution. That's what we do, and it protects the people, and we protect ourselves. That's what's supposed to happen, but it's not. And we're proud of it, too. Have you heard people how proud they are? Got to keep us safe, and you'd be safe. So sacrifice all your rights to be safe. But let me ask you, if you know this guy was there with a brick and you had just killed his sister and you were in that car, would you feel safe? I would hope not, because I don't care how many cops go around that car. I don't care what security you put on it. I don't care how I threaten him. You're getting hit in the head with a brick. That's gonna happen. Because if we stop him, she's gonna do it instead. She didn't do it, he's gonna do it. Oh, you're gonna do it, and then you're gonna do it. And someone's gonna get a brick in that car. That's gonna happen. So it hurts us. It allows us to do things like create lists. Oh my God, create lists. And people think that's good too. Can you hear people say it? Well, this guy shouldn't get in a plane. He's on the no-fly list. He shouldn't get a gun. He's on the no-fly list. Okay, who makes that list? Does anybody know? I don't, but it's some bureaucrat, for sure, right? What if someone might be on the list? You maybe should be on that list. I'm not sure. I'm a bureaucrat. Do I put you on that list? You know I do. You know I do, because if I don't, and you do something bad, I'm fired. You're on that list. Maybe you, you. Now hold on, now you say I don't want to be on that list. Can you get me off that list? I don't want to talk to you, you're on a terrorist list. I'm not joking. That's real. I don't want to talk to you because you're on a list. But I want to tell you so I can get off the list. Yeah, but you're on a terrorist watch list. Yeah, I don't know if I want to talk to you. Do you have rights? Not really. You're on a list. This is like a bad TV show, but people are proud of this. They think the list is magical. No, it's made by regular people who don't know any better and who are scared. Why in the world would that be okay? But I'll go one step further. Do you know what that list actually says? It says we are okay prosecuting thought crimes. It's 1984? I think it is. We are okay prosecuting thought crimes. I'm going to punish you because you might have thought something, maybe you're punished. How is that okay? Now we can drone people because they're terrorists. Now we can arrest them because they're terrorists. Worse, they can be Americans. They can be Americans. Do you know what is legal right now? I'll tell you what's legal right now. Donald Trump becomes president, Hillary Clinton becomes president, whoever that person is becomes president coming up here, right? They become president. And they say, all right, Congress, I want you all to pass a bill on X. 
Please, I want to see a show of hands. Who say no? Nays in the air. Great. You are all terrorists. Arrest Guantanamo Bay. That is a legal move. It's a legal move. He will assign them all as terrorists and send them to Guantanamo Bay. He doesn't have to have due process. Thanks to the, uh, the Patriot Act, he doesn't need due process. No worries. You all go to Gitmo. See you in court. This is Saddam Hussein stuff. Right? This is what Saddam Hussein did. That's what we have now. The war on terror has turned us into a police state, and the saddest part is most people are happy about it because they're afraid. And I do what I always do. I'll go one step further. They're scared of ISIS. I hear it all the time. More people die of anything than ISIS. Name something. Cows, yes. Mites, yes. Paper cuts, yes. It doesn't matter what you name, more people die of it than ISIS in America, guaranteed. What if they killed three people in how many years? Not just that, there's about, what, 20,000 fighters? There's more New York City cops than there are ISIS, more. And we're scared of them? They're 6,000 miles away in caves surrounded by at least five to 10 trained soldiers all around them who don't like them. And they have to go through France and England to get to us, and those countries have nuclear weapons. And we're scared of ISIS. Shame on us. We should feel shame when we feel that fear. How dare us be afraid of that? We are a recruiting tool for them. They get mad at us so they can be recruited. And we think, well, we'll drone and we'll bomb them. Their number one recruiter has been dead for three years. He lives on the internet. He's already dead, and he's still getting people. Oh, but Larry, you understand, they're inspiring our people. That's what they're doing, they're inspiring our people. They're ISIS-inspired attacks. Great. I think the King of Spain is amazing, and I'm gonna yell, I love the King of Spain, and then I'm gonna come by and shoot somebody. Clearly that was a Spanish, you know, initiated attack, we should declare war on Spain. It is exactly the same thing. They simply announce that they love something, make an attack, and what do we do? Fear machine rock, rock and roll, fear machine rock and roll, and now ISIS is attacking us. Let me tell you about homegrown terrorism. Why do these people, why are they homegrown terrorists? Here's the reason why. Every single person who was a homegrown terrorist was in some way, shape, or form angry at the situation and blamed America. Everyone. So what got them together? They weren't religious. They were not religious. That was not a common denominator. They were not religious. They were angry at the situation and they blamed America. Well, who else is angry at the situation and blames America? Huh, that would be people overseas like ISIS and Al-Qaeda. That's how they join. And that's what they do what they do. So guess what would stop the people here from doing that? Prosperity. That would stop them from wanting to be terrorists. Prosperity. The one thing that many of these people have, or sorry, many people don't have, is a fun, good life. They don't have that. But I'll go one step further. Why do they hate us so much? Why are they saying, yes, America is so bad? Because we drone them, because we bomb them, because we're there. I want you to imagine something for a minute. I'll give you another imaginary piece if I could. Imagine it's September 12th, 2001. 9-11 happens, September 12th, here's what we do. We do two things. Number one, we take all of our forces that we can possibly gather, all of our special forces, the best in the world, and we focus specifically on getting Osama bin Laden. Step one. Step two, we completely and totally withdraw from the Middle East. Walk away. Pack up, walk away. Imagine that for a moment. If we took all of our best our best special forces and went after Osama bin Laden, we probably would have got him in about two years or less. Most people who know that know that's probably an accurate statement. No, not 100%, 100%, we can't be sure, but the odds are very high, we would have got him in about two years. If we said every special forces pe person we had after him, we probably would have got him in a couple years. He'd have been dead, he's done, we'll go the Middle East. What would have happened? I'm sorry? Probably not, the Pakistanis don't war with us, but they would have already done it. We already went in there and took Osama bin Laden out already. If they were going to go war with us, they would have gone already. You know what would have happened? They'd be fighting someone else. I don't know who, but not us. The Russians would have moved in, the French would have moved in, or no one would have moved in. 
and they would have fought themselves or whatever the case may be, right? They would have done what they had to do. The problem is they have to have their own revolutionary war and or their own civil war, but we won't let them. We had ours. Canada became a country with no war. We became a country with war. Both are the right answer because we chose. The Canadians said we don't have to go to war. We said we do. Okay, both the right answer. Let the Middle East decide when they will become countries, how they'll be become countries on their own. Some will choose war and some won't. The point is they will choose and they should choose, not us. They should adopt democracy when they're ready, on their timeline, not ours. No one forced us to do this. How dare us force them? And here's the worst part. It never works. There's the worst part. It never works. And all you hear people say is, we got to fight them there so we don't fight them here. Well, guess what? I'm a vet. Vet lives matter. 6,000, 7,000 dead in those two wars. Not just that, all the wounded, all the guys with PTSD, all the guys and gals with traumatic brain injury. That's 20 to 30,000 lives ruined. Ruined. For what? So we can act like we're not afraid? How many lives have to be destroyed until our leaders go, I feel better about myself now? And then we do it, they die, they become injured, they come home, and how do we take care of them? We don't. Broken VA system, wave a flag, and that's it. And then they're broken. About 100 Americans, give or take, commit suicide every day. About 22 of them are veterans. Veterans are about 10% of the population. That's double. VA, how's that doing? Not so good. That's our war on terror. Our war on terror is a shame. It is embarrassing. It is immoral, and it doesn't work. All of our wars need to stop. And just to give a plug, only the Libertarian Party will say this. Only the Libertarian Party will say this. Republicans and Democrats will not. They will just have a different level of how much do we bomb and who do we bomb. But we're bombing. They want to send you off to war. Yes, they do. Different country, different amount. Yeah, but you're going to war. And when you come back, they will discard you because they never cared about you in the first place. The war on terror needs to stop. The war on drugs needs to stop. Thank you.